Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to my channel for another Hot Toys Thor Love and Thunder 1-6 scale figure unboxing and review. Today we're taking a look at the deluxe version of Thor. Now I got mine at a discount from Pop Collectibles. As always, do your own research, make sure you're comfortable before buying. I have popped the link to their site in the description below, along with the discount code Justin's Collection for 5% off your order if you do decide to buy from them. While you're down there, why not hit that subscribe, bell notification icon and join button, so you're notified as soon as a brand new Hot Toys MCU figure review goes live on the channel. As for the box art, yes it's busy, but I think it looks great. It's bright, it's colourful, there's a lot going on, but it's just so much fun. We've got a Thor Love and Thunder logo, this explosion in the background with this rainbow effect to it, an image of Thor off to one side carrying Stormbreaker, and of course, he's wearing his helmet. Then on the side of the box, a bolt of lightning and a bunch more colours. They've also added this texture in the background to give it more visual interest. We have his name, some lightning, and down below, deluxe version. Around the back, artwork on the right, warnings and legal info on the left. I do like how they've got these bits of lightning sticking out from the white banner just to make it look like this is a massive bolt of lightning. Now the question that I hope to answer by the end of this video is, is this the ultimate 1-6 scale Hot Toys Thor? Or does that title go to one of the previous ones? Y'all know me, my favourite Hot Toys Thor is still the road worn one, even though we have had multiple Thor releases since then. They've been dope, they haven't quite beaten Roadworn though. Underneath the lid we have a translucent acrylic slipcover with the triangle logo that we just saw on the back of the box printed on the surface. Going with translucent smoked acrylic I think is a nice and classy touch. It adds a little bit of suspense to the unboxing experience because you get a sneak preview of the figure underneath. First in hand impressions for Thor from Love and Thunder. So far so good, he feels nice and sturdy, and the outfit is extremely colourful, although I know that some people immediately aren't going to like that. What we are going to do now is get all of his accessories laid out in the light box and take a closer look at everything he comes with. Starting off with the display base first, which is done in the typical Hot Toys hexagonal style, meaning it's quite low profile, relatively compact, and thanks to the flat sides, we can have other hexagon bases pressed up right alongside it, saving us a ton of room in the display. Up on top, we've got a glossy Stormbreaker logo, which does contrast against the blue textured background. A Thor Love and Thunder movie logo, and Thor for the nameplate, done in a different font as compared to usual. They have opted to go with a dynamic flight pole and spring-loaded waist clamp. Even though this is foam padded, to be careful, these clamps, because the spring inside is so strong, they do tend to dig into rubbery superhero suits over time. We will, of course, discuss this stuff in way more detail when we actually pop it on him. For now, just know that if you go for the deluxe version of Thor, you get a helmeted head sculpt, some interchangeable gold chainmail arms, swap out chest plate with the skirt piece attached. They're definitely getting their money's worth out of the upgraded and much larger Stormbreaker mold. We first got it with Endgame Thor, then with Gore, and now with Thor from Love and Thunder. So this is the third use of this mold. The handle has heaps of texture on it, washes in the crevices of course to bring out the sculpt work, and even the rings down below. The top part is made of plastic, yet because of the metallic shine and the pitting and the gold and black washes to bring out the sculpt work, from a distance it almost reads as though it could be made of metal until you turn the lights on, because it does have an LED light up effect. They've cleverly disguised the button up on top, so if you weren't looking for it, you probably wouldn't spot it. We've got a couple of LEDs on each side and one around the back. The internal sculpt work is done to make it look like the lightning is coursing through it by having it appear slightly wavy. What a way to ruin a beautifully painted weapon. Hide all of those paint applications with some really cheap and nasty looking slightly metallic clear plastic lightning pieces. So we have one, two, three, four, five in total. This one I really don't understand at all. These ones they're far too thick and chonky to actually look believable as though they're real lightning. 
Now you can use a UV torch to make them glow blue. That to me makes even less sense than having them on there in the first place. Lucky for us, we have a hell of a lot more lightning to look at. We're not actually going to look at each individual piece. We'll do that when we pop these all on Thor. We've got the lightning discs, more lightning discs, the arm ones, and even some little ones for his eyes. Zeus's Thunderbolt is a must-include accessory, so I'm really glad it's here. You can split it in half this time, and you can remove this middle core piece so it's not just sticking out randomly. It just adds some structure in the middle when you connect the two together. And the lightning effects are also removable. Or you can grab your UV torch and randomly shine it on the effect pieces. It's there if you want it. Now it's cast out of translucent plastic, not the same colour translucent plastic as Valkyrie's Thunderbolt. And the one that came with Valkyrie is significantly smaller. I'd call Valkyrie's one translucent yellow, whereas Thor's has a metallic sheen to it, more like gold. And lastly, a full array of hands. They all have these armour plates on the back with the old trim, then the matte blue diamond pattern in the middle. There's some wrinkling on the fingers and even some fingernails sculpted in. So we get these relaxed, sort of open palm hands, splayed out finger hands, some gripping hands, which are made of this quite soft rubbery plastic, so stretching them open to fit the large handle for Stormbreaker in shouldn't be an issue. They've also included some wrist pegs without the joint in them, just because Stormbreaker is heavy, so if you have the jointed ones in, the hands may droop down over time. And lastly, two closed fists already installed on him out of the box. What we are going to do now, though, is get Thor himself out here. Standing straight up and down in the light box, no crazy poses or accessories or anything like that. This release is simultaneously one of the most hideous and awesome Thor figures that I've ever seen from Hot Toys. I don't know whether to love it or hate it. That's probably going to become a little bit more clear to me as we progress through the video. Nevertheless, proportions. Let's start there. He looks very real. He's nice and broad at the shoulders, helped in part by the clever costuming with the shoulder pads. Then he tapers down at the waist for that you flip too hard, damn it, physique. The outfit hugs the body in all the right places, and colour and detail wise, let's just say he's not going to go unnoticed on a Thor shelf. Then we get to the unhelmeted head sculpt. Could they have done better? Yeah, absolutely. Do I hate it? No, I don't think I do. Overall, for a figure that most people are going to skip anyway due to the film it's based off, I think Hot Toys translated this look from screen to figure pretty successfully. Up close and personal, kicking things off with Thor's first head sculpt. We will try out the helmeted one when we switch out the other armour bits and pieces. So right off the bat, I do not think this is a perfect sculpt, far from it in fact. Some people speculated that this was based off the Age of Ultron sculpt, and while there are similarities, I can also see a lot of differences. They've added the scar, they've changed the hair entirely, and they've added a ton more skin texture. This might not be their best Thor head sculpt in terms of likeness, but it absolutely is when it comes to detail. There is just so much more to look at here. There's more pore definition, you've got more wrinkling, the frown lines look better, and the skin tone and skin texture match between the sculpt and the neck. Perfect. No complaints there. However, that doesn't mean I don't have any complaints at all. The one thing, the one thing that they could have done to make this head sculpt so much better than all of the previous Thor sculpts would have been to give this guy moving eyes. Unfortunately, they simply decided not to. What they did decide to do, though, is add the stupid UV reflective paint. So if you have a UV torch that you want to point at your Thor, then yes, his eyes do glow blue. It's there if you want it, I simply don't. Then we get to the hair sculpt. This is all rubbery plastic and the strands are quite thin, so if you wanted to heat some of them up and then reshape them, so bring these ones around the front, you totally can. Out of the box, they are just back over his ear, which is probably where I'm going to leave them. The big drawback with the sculpted hair is that you kind of get no articulation. You'll see what I mean when we get to the articulation segment. Got some braids sculpted in, and 
They have hit it with a wash, so you can see the individual strands and the layers do stand out, plus there's a lighter gold dry brush over the top. It seems as though someone's been doing their cape homework, because for once, Hot Toys have given us a very solid cape. It drapes beautifully thanks to the two-ply lightweight fabric it's made of, and it's got the accurate V-shaped creases down the middle. It's wired along the edges and in the pleats, which are stitched in so you don't have to worry about them fading or becoming unraveled. The benefit of having wires along the edges means that with the way they've rolled the fabric for the cape underneath the wires, you can shape it so that it looks like the cape is just hanging naturally over his shoulder pads. Speaking of the shoulder pads, back around the front, they are made of two separate pieces of rubbery plastic. They are stacked on top of one another and they've got the gold trim and the matte blue in the middle. They're adjustable so if you want to flare them out to get them out of the way of the arms for maximum range of motion or simply to alter his proportions, that's an option. For me, I like to leave them somewhere in the middle. Now his torso is entirely made of sculpted plastic. Even the quilted like stitching around the sides, not fabric all plastic. Some people have said that this design is too busy, and I get it, there's a lot of gold, there's the matte blue, there's the metallic blue, there's the silver, and there's the black. I don't hate this though. I think it works. Yes, it's hectic, but it's so much fun. It's bright, it's colourful, and there's no denying that this guy is 100% going to stand out in your display. Who would have thought that the best Silicon Arms Hot Toys have made to date were going to come packaged with a Thor Love and Thunder release? But here we are, and there they are, looking sensational. The skin texture is incredible. There's shading, musculature, vein work, and the matteness. The matteness is what gets me. This looks like real skin. Versus the Infinity War arms, yes, the definition is a bit more visible thanks to the lack of sculpted skin texture, they're so much shinier though, and while some people might like that, I don't. Not to mention they're nowhere near as durable as these new silicon arms are. The gauntlets are free floating, look at the shine on that metallic by the way. They're quite loose, which I think is a good thing, because if they were tighter and you were rotating them constantly, you may do damage to the silicon, so going looser in this instance, I'm okay with it. Coming down to his skirt area, the side ones are made of rubbery plastic so they're not going to deform on you, whereas the front one may because it's made of a softer rubbery material. Which means when you have his legs posed forward, it will put pressure on this and this could get wrinkled, creased or start to uh, curl, which I hope doesn't happen. The pants unfortunately are made of pleather. And there's even some screen printing on the pleather, so we're doubling down on pleather. I've said pleather way too many times already. There is some hidden chainmail detail underneath the side skirt pieces, and if you prefer to have that on full display, you can rotate the pants and then rotate the leg and boot guard so that this is now more around the front. We're about to get to the switch out pieces, I promise. I'm curious to see what they look like on him as well. The boots are made of rubbery plastic, so you could potentially heat them up if you wanted to to reshape them, which I might do because the huge integrated knee pads are making contact with the pleather pants and friction is pleather's worst nightmare. This could cause some peeling. Try and leave a gap between the two pieces if possible. So there's a lot of gold, there's some black, metallic blue, and a ton of that matte blue. It's something that I didn't love on screen, in figure format, I don't know what it is, but it works for me. Oh, and it is a split cut boot design, so you can articulate the feet separately to the top portion of the boots. On the underside, we've got some sculpted tread with a dry brush over the top. That's something that they don't do all that often. So we're going to do this in two stages. We're going to have a look at him with his bare arms and all the lightning pieces. Then we're going to have a look at him with the armoured arms, the helmet and the switch out chest plate. And after that we'll look at him with the armour and the lightning pieces. So to attach the disc ones, it's quite straightforward. You just want to wedge your fingernail underneath the gap. You can see there's a little notch for these discs, then you can remove them. After you've done that, you can then bring in the replacement lightning version and plug that in position. 
So to save on time, watching me do every single one of these on camera... Oh. Uh... Yeah. No. Not for me. All of these little clear plastic protrusions... They don't read as though they're lightning, they more so read as though there's a bunch of shit stuck all over him. The outfit is already busy enough. The last thing this guy needs is all of this stuff on him. If you like this, I'm genuinely happy for you. The only benefit of having these pieces, in my opinion, is that for figure photography, you don't have to do as much work adding all the lightning on. You can use these as a template, then enhance them with a bit of glow and some white. Maybe if we turn the LEDs on, that will help. I guess we're about to find out. Step one is to remove this panel around the back by wedging your fingernail underneath that little notch at the bottom. After you've done that, getting it started, you can just take it off. Then make sure you flick the switch first because I promise you, when you plug in your USB-C cable, which isn't included, you're not going to be able to reach that switch easily. I decided to go with a USB power bank for my power supply, let it do all the heavy lifting figuring out what wattage and voltage this needs. If you want to get one, the specifications are printed right below the USB-C port. Okay, I'll admit it, with the LEDs turned on he does look better. Just be careful with the USB power, some people think that now that they have gone USB you can leave him powered on all the time. Don't do that. If you do, you will burn out the LEDs very, very quickly. You still have to power cycle him every now and then to make sure you're not stressing out the LEDs and therefore burning them out. Now, the chest is lit up, you can see all the discs are, but the arms aren't. So their clever solution for that is, once again, a stupid UV light-up effect. So you have to bring in your torch or retrofit your cabinet with some UV lights and then you can make full use of all these lightning pieces. I still don't get the UV paint thing. If you do, please just let me know down in the comments below. Oh wow, that is a lot of gold. Too much gold, some would say, and I just happen to be one of those people. The outfit was already just on the cusp of being too busy. Now that we've added the shinier silver accented chest plate and the gold chainmail arms made out of rubbery plastic so you can still bend them and there's some musculature poking through, and the shiny helmet, it's just too much. Visually speaking, there's far too much going on. Keep it simple, Marvel. This design doesn't work in figure format and it didn't work on screen. The helmet... I may consider using from time to time, because we just don't get to see Thor wearing his classic looking helmet very often. This isn't that, it's a stylized take on it. Still, I'm here for it. The wings are huge, we also have some blue line work and some blue accenting up on top, it's all shiny. There's an eagle head, a second set of wings around the back, and his eyes do light up, plus we've got some effect pieces that you can pop in. The skin tone match between the mouth area and the neck is on point. The only real complaints I have are that, number one, the nose is quite wide so it spreads out the eyes making them look a bit wide set, and number two, the rubbery plastic hair, while it's detailed well just like the other head sculpt, does push up on the shoulders a little so that when you have the head sculpt sitting on it, it likes to ride a little bit high. Just make sure you're pushing it all the way down, fighting that hair, and it should stay in place. Even I can't deny, with his LED eyes turned on, dude looks sick. He's menacing, it's a really cool effect. If only we could have this powered on all the time. Instead of going with some kind of magnetic power transfer function through the neck from the USB cable, which they absolutely could have done, we've seen them do it before, they went with button cell batteries for the head sculpt. So that means they're bright now, they're not going to be bright for much longer. You know how just before I was saying that the hair likes to push the head sculpt up and off the neck connector? Well now you also have to thread it in and around the lightning pieces, including around the back because the lightning wraps around his shoulders for some reason. That makes it even more challenging to get the head sculpt to sit down all the way on the neck as it's supposed to, which is right there. No, it doesn't feel like doing that, it rides quite high. Now, you can still bring in the UV torch of course and selectively shine it on random pieces to illuminate them even further. 
I don't know what else to say really, except for I'm just not a fan of this. If you're curious what he looks like with the optional chest plate and chainmail arms on, wearing the unhelmeted head sculpt, this is what that looks like. And now vice versa, there you go. I personally prefer the unhelmeted head sculpt with the bare arms or the helmet with the chainmail arms but you can mix and match if you want to. If you're planning on displaying your new Thor with the gold chainmail arms on, therefore you have these left over, yes, they are compatible with the Infinity War body. The ball joint is the exact same size. Now that I'm seeing both arms on the same body side by side, I don't think I can go back to the thermoplastic ones, but I am curious. Let me know down in the comments below. Which style of arm design do you prefer? silicon or thermoplastic rubber. Now there is a difference in skin tone between the hand and the arm. I don't think that's a massive deal because the gauntlet does break it up anyway. For a quick side-by-side -side comparison, on the left Thor from Love and Thunder, and on the right Roadworn Thor from Ragnarok, who is still my undisputed favourite Hot Toys Thor. They're just two completely different vibes. How did we go from the dark, gritty aesthetic on the right to the bright, colourful, whimsical almost outfit on the left? I just don't understand. While I like both of them for different reasons, if I had to pick one over the other, you'll already know it's Roadworn Thor. I mean, look what they did to our boy. How did we go from the costume in Infinity War being slick and streamlined yet having classic elements at the same time, to Love and Thunder. It's still a head scratcher to me. As you can see, Infinity War Thor is ever so slightly taller than the Love and Thunder one. And I think that's down to the ankle connectors. With Infinity War, they're double ball pegs, whereas for the new guy, they're hinges and swivels. All right, I think I've cracked the code. So Love and Thunder figures work best next to other Love and Thunder releases. It's only when you start to compare this bright, colourful, rock and roll, poppy aesthetic to pre-Thor 4 MCU costumes that things start to fall apart. Because next to Valkyrie, I don't mind if I do. They've got this shared design language with the discs and the busyness, so they work standing next to each other, no problem. The only thing that kind of jumps out at me as being a bit odd is that I reckon Valkyrie is a touch underscaled. Luckily, that's a non-issue with Gore and Thor. The scaling here looks about right to me, even though I do have Gore hunched slightly forward because of the pose I had him in. Gore's costume is the antithesis of Thor's outfit. It's not bright, it's not structured, it's just white, baggy, grotty, dirty looking robes. So you might think the styles would clash, Somehow, because they are polar opposites, they work together. Going over articulation, starting off with Thor's head sculpt. Theoretically speaking, because it is on a fixed neck and a magnet, we should have plenty of range of motion. In practice, however, because of the sculpted plastic hair, not so much. Looking forward to there, looking up to there, swivel and a little bit of pivot side to side. His arms are plugged in on ball joints and they're on hinges. Going up to there, going forward and back, the ball joints act as a butterfly that also goes up and down. There is a swivel at the bicep underneath the silicon skin. Because it likes to move around on you, it's a bit tricky to access. I would suggest bending the elbow a couple of clicks first and using the forearm to leverage the bicep swivel. Speaking of the elbow, Double bend going past 90, then for the wrist peg, it's a hinge and swivel. The torso does have electronics inside, so going forward, pretty much nothing. Same with going back, no swivel or tilt. Do be mindful of the skirts when you're moving the legs forward to about there. Going out to there, swivel at the upper thigh. Ratcheted double bend at the knee going past 90. And then for the ankles, a split cut boot design and a hinge and swivel. Think a massive wrist peg. So out of the box, it's set up for forward and back and rotation. If you wanted to go side to side, you have to move the joint around underneath the boot guard, and then you'll be able to use it for ankle tilt. Usually I prefer a double ball peg with this setup. Not for Thor though. If history has taught us anything, it's that 
Thor figures are too heavy for a double ball peg at the ankles. So going with the hinge and swivel is the sturdier option. If you find that it's getting loose, take off the foot, tighten up the screw, and that should fix it. Moving on to the three cool and three annoying things. The first annoying thing is even though this display base is compatible with the crotch grabber, they still continue to insist on only including one option which in this case is the flight pole and waist clamp combo. They know full well at this point that if you leave Thor attached to that waist clamp long term, it's going to dig into his suit and cause irreversible damage. Hot Toys, you're better than this. The second annoying thing is the pleather. I don't know why they went with pleather, Infinity War Thor, Endgame Thor, Road Worn Thor, Gladiator Thor, no pleather. It's like they're just making a joke out of it at this point, because they didn't need to use it, they just wanted to. The third annoying thing is, we've had countless Thor figures from Hot Toys at this point, and not a single one of them has had moving eyes. I don't get it, what did Valkyrie and Thor do to you Hot Toys? How do you give moving eyes to Gore and Mighty Thor in the Love and Thunder line, but not the main character whose name is in the freaking title of the movie for crying out loud? The first cool thing has to be the deluxe accessories. Having all of this included without needing to go ahead and buy a second Thor like we used to have to do back in the day if you wanted armoured or light armoured, those were two completely different figures. With this guy, you can just switch out the parts every now and then and keep him fresh in the display. Second cool thing, the silicon arms. These things are gorgeous. There's tons of skin texture, there's vein work, there's shading, there's defined musculature, and because they're made of silicon versus the old school thermoplastic rubber, they feel more durable as well. The third cool thing is they're improving. They've given us a really solid cape. It drapes perfectly, it's nice and heavy, it's got the creases down the middle, the pleats are baked in, and it's wired. So you get the best of both worlds. You can have it hanging behind his back naturally, or you can get crazy with it and have it billowing off in the wind for dynamic poses. Wrapping up on Hot Toy Thor from Love and Thunder. How is it that Taika can give us one of the best Thor movies ever in Thor Ragnarok, and also one of the worst in Thor Love and Thunder? For what it's worth, I had fun with Thor 4. It doesn't hold a candle to Ragnarok. This figure is kind of like Taika's Thor films. It's both one of the best Thor figures ever, and also potentially one of the worst. Let me explain. So arguments for it being one of the best are as follows. New seamless silicon arms with the most amount of detail I've ever seen on a pair by Hot Toys, a cape that works for once, two solid sculpts, and tons of accessories. Then on the flip side of the coin, the design with all of the extra armour pieces and lightning on is so busy that it looks like a spiky, shiny gold mess. The sculpts are solid like I said, but neither is perfect. And they killed all of the torso articulation in favour of a light up effect. You may be fine with all of that, or you may not, at least now you know. Where do I sit? I actually really enjoy this figure. It's fun. It's never going to fade into the background due to the design and its seamless head to toe. But a definitive Hot Toys Thor, this is not. Now if they'd have made the fur cape Thor from Love and Thunder, we'd be having an entirely different discussion. That design I believe would have dethroned Road Worn Thor, so uh, yeah, Hot Toys, get to work. Toy Fair exclusive fur cape Thor, get it done. Now I got my Love and Thunder Thor from Pop Collectibles at a discount. As always, do your own research, make sure you're comfortable before buying. I have popped the link to their site in the description below, along with the discount code Justin's Collection, for 5% off your order if you do decide to buy from them. While you're down there, why not hit that subscribe, bell notification icon and join button, if you like the sound of seeing your name in the end credits of my reviews. Like, comment and subscribe, we'll catch you in the next video.